says it, uh, uh, he says it this way. It is scarcely possible to avoid comparing the eye with a telescope. This is one of his main, uh, uh, really important word pictures. As we said at level 2b when we're looking at, at, the, at the rhetoric of this text, how he uses great word pictures. Think about telescopes, he says. They obviously have evolved over time. I mean, obviously, the telescopes that Darwin was working with and the scientists around him were a whole lot better than the telescope of Galileo, for example, right? It's scarcely possible, he said, to avoid comparing the eye with a telescope. We know that this instrument has been perfected by the long-continued efforts of the highest human intellects. He's talking about the telescope, right? And we naturally infer that the eye has been formed by a somewhat analogous process. But may not this inference be presumptuous? Have we any right to assume that the Creator works by intellectual powers like those of man? And then he says, if we must compare the eye to an optical instrument, we ought in imagination to take a thick layer of transparent tissue with spaces filled with fluid and with a nerve sensitive to light beneath, and then suppose every part of this layer is to be continually changing slowly in density, so as to separate into the layers of different densities and thicknesses, placed at different distances from each other, and with the surfaces of each layer slowly changing in form. Further, we must suppose that there's a power represented by natural selection of the survival of the fittest, always intently watching each slight alteration in the transparent layers and carefully preserving each with uh, which, under varied circumstances, in any way or in any degree, tends to produce a distincter image. Again, Beautiful language. No, by the way, just from a rhetoric point of view, did you notice how long that last sentence was that I read? And yet, through the use of commas, he makes this brilliant, brilliant kind of uh, rhetoric composition very, very readable. It's almost like, at the times, I feel like reading good poetry of a kind. A few pages later, he says it this way. Um, he says, with respect to the belief that organic beings have been created beautiful for the delight of man, a belief which it has been pronounced is subversive of my whole theory. I must first remark that the sense of beauty obviously depends on the nature of the mind, irrespective of any real quality in the admired object, and that the idea of what is beautiful is not innate or unalterable. We see this, for instance, in the men of different races admiring an entirely different standard of beauty in their women. Uh, 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 again, we're in the time period of the Victorian era when obviously we're going to be very misogynist often in our language. And notice here, he says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, especially when we're talking about men talking about, notice here, he, he calls it their women, right? There's a whole lot of this, of this uh, text that we look at today and we go, he would probably have used politically correct language of a different kind, writing, of course, for today. If, he says, beautiful objects had been created solely for man's gratification, it ought to be shown that before man appeared, there was less beauty on the face of the earth than since he came on the stage. It's an interesting idea, right? And, of course, it created a lot of controversy online like this, no question. Uh, I'll finish with one more uh, from later in this chapter, um, another set of lines which I find interesting to read. He who believes, these are the, the last, uh, these are the last uh, lines of, uh, of, chapter, of chapter number seven. He who believes that some ancient form was transformed suddenly through an internal force or tendency into, for instance, one furnished with wings, will be almost compelled to assume, in opposition to all analogy, that many individuals varied simultaneously. It cannot be denied that such abrupt and great changes of structure are widely different from those which most species apparently have undergone. He will further be compelled to believe that many structures beautifully adapted to all the other parts of the, great, uh, of the same creature and to the surrounding conditions have been suddenly produced and of such complex and wonderful co-adaptations that he will not be able to assign a shadow of an explanation. He will be forced to admit that these great and sudden transformations have left no trace of their action on the embryo. To admit all this, as it seems to me, to enter into the realms of miracle is to leave those of science. Well, uh, there was a, obviously a lot of debate about a line like this. Again, many people argue that to believe in this kind of thing is itself quasi-miraculous because there are so many questions left unanswered. For Darwin himself, one of the penultimate questions in the idea, and he had to deal with it in a descent of man to some degree, is the idea of what is sometimes referred to as altruism, or the idea of the conscience, the idea of ethics and morals, and where do those kinds of things come from. The willingness, for example, to sacrifice one's life for the good of another seems to belie the idea of survival of the species or the fittest, unless, of course, you're making some kind of altruistic argument that's passed down from species to species. Speaking of, to chapter 8. Instinct is this chapter. 
He says instinct is, you know, kind of difficult to define. He says it's kind of like habit, but it's inherited. The causes of innate inst instincts, he says, are frankly quite unknown. Darwin will discuss hens, he'll discuss bees, he'll go to a number of word pictures to try and help, help understand these ideas of these instincts. They are a result, he argues, of slight modifications, again, over time. Natural selection, in other words, will somehow um, uh, pick the advantageous instincts and, and uh, perpetuates them in some way. There is, of course, the final question, and this was an interesting question for Darwin. What about worker ants that are, in fact, sterile, right? Um, now, genetics will come along later to explain this. It's interesting the number of questions that Darwin raises that he can't answer, and yet he's honest enough to raise them. He says the smartest animals are the ones that survive. This lead, led a whole bunch of social Darwinists um, to the eugenics projects, again, of the 20th century, and we're familiar with the, hor the horror of, of, of that whole idea. Um, I'll read one line uh, from chapter 8 uh, that I find compelling for you. It comes right at the end. Therefore, he says thus, As I believe the most wonderful of all known instincts, that of the high beeve, can be explained by natural selection having taken advantage of numerous successive slight modifications of simpler instincts. Natural selection, having by slow degrees more and more perfectly led the bees to sweep equal spheres at a given distance from each other in a double layer and to build up and excavate the wax along the planes of intersection. The bees, of course, no more knowing that they swept their spheres at one particular distance from each other than they know that they are the several ang uh, angles of the hexagonal prisms and of the basal rhombic plates. In other words, the ways that bees create hives. I mean, uh, this takes us all the way back to Virgil. He and his, and his Gorgas was very interested in why can bees do what bees do? Chapter 9 takes us to um, hybridism, um, the problem of the sterility of hybrid species, often sterile. Their causes, again, are often unknown. He says, we know so little about the reproductive systems of many species. And again, he says, the mistake of systematic affinity, the stallion, for example, horse, and the female ass, for example, is his, is his example. Darwin will leave the question of how varieties become species uh, really kind of unanswered. Um, we work within chapters 10, uh, uh, 11, 12, and 13 now really quickly on the imperfection of the geological record, on the geological succession of, uh, of, of organic beings, um, geographical distribution, and the like. Um, he asks, what role has geographical isolation and migration played in species development? He was acutely aware of this because of not only the research that was being done on the day, early understandings of plate tectonics and the like, but he had himself traveled, of course, right? He says... Each individual species is formed in one particular location and then it spreads. Darwin will discuss the importance of the Ice Age and the supposed land bridge, right? In, his, in, the, in the 11th chapter, he will ask, how do similar species exist in different freshwater environments geographically isolated? It's a fascinating question for his day. And then, of course, there's this idea of changes in land levels, rivers flowing into one another that now later do not. He says migration has as well played an important role in natural selection. He says species of any island are always most similar to the species of the nearest mainland, which is an interesting insight, of course. And then he says both migration and species survival are, in large measure, a matter of chance. And this notion of chance then obviously opened the door to, well, then how do you account for the fact that here humans are, right? The 14th chapter, Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings, um, he's going to play around with morphology and embryology as well. Now again, in our studies of both of those, morphology and embryology, today we look back to a text like Origin of Species and we say, you know, uh, while he was ahead of his time, there was just a whole lot that he could not have known at all. Darwin will, for example, um, talk about families and genre to illustrate chains of descent with modification. Morphology, of course, the underlying structural relationships between physical organs of, se of separate species. He has something to say about that. The development of embryos. He shows how species descended from a common ancestry. Um, we have rudimentary organs that are also very important. Organs that are somehow left over from previous species. Um, you know, any number of examples of this. When you look, for example, at the embryo, it looks like, for example, turtles might have had fingers in the corner the question of the tailbone for humans, etc., etc. He says the current state of species is far from perfect. By the 15th chapter, we come to the conclusion of the origin of species, what he calls recapitulation and conclusion. He says he is aware there are serious problems and challenges 
to his theory. Now, historians have debated about whether Darwin really believed that, or he needed to say that so that he didn't create a tremendous amount of controversy by arguing, I know I'm right. There is an argument that Darwin waited to publish his ideas because he knew he was going to upset people, or because he knew that it was, it was something where there were a lot of questions he was going to get asked, and he'd have to say, you know, I really don't know, and that bothered him as a scientist. He outlines the key ideas, and in fact, I mean, if you're, only going to, if you're only going to read one chapter after, as we suggest, the fourth chapter, the 15th chapter as a summary is a useful one. There are several key ideas here. He says, uh, um, variation does exist in nature, right? He says, just to remind, species engage in the struggle for existence, this survival, this competition, right? He says, natural selection preserves uh, advantageous variations over time. And these variations cause the proliferation of variations in future generations. Then, interestingly, Darwin predicts a revolution in science that's about to come. It's almost as if he knew, very similar to um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, that he knew that he was just at the beginning of something that was about to transpire going forward. And notice, of course, in 1859, we're just about, you know, ha we're obviously halfway through the century, but we're headed towards the 20th century, and of course now the 21st century, and the science that today we constitute as building in large measure off of Darwin. He was predicting so much of this. Finally, at the very, interest, at the very end of this thing, he notes that a creator may have breathed life into one or more original species. In fact, this passage is so remarkable, and the final lines of the or origin of species is so remarkable, that we can go ahead and read the final paragraph together. It's quite fascinating. He says, uh, just before the last paragraph, Hence, we may look with some confidence to a secure future of great length, and as natural selection works, he says, solely by and for the good of each being, all corporal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. It is interesting, now to finish, it is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, are dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. This passage could have been lifted right out of Emerson's essay, uh, Nature, and of course, ten years later, we will have Emerson's essay, who, you know, very influenced, obviously. These laws, to continue Darwin, these laws, taken in the largest sense, being growth with reproduction, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction, variability from the indirect and direct action of the conditions of life and from use and disuse, a ratio of increase so high as natural so as to lead to a struggle for life, <clears throat> excuse me, and as a consequence the natural selection entailing, entailing divergence of character and the extension of less improved forms. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals directly falls. There is grandeur in this view of life with its se several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator, capital C by the way, into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved one use of the word in the text. Of course, the rest, as they say, is in fact history. But it is a beautiful ongoing history. It is that tension or dialectic between ideas which will produce, of course, in the 21st century, the science that we are all kind of watching unfold in front of us. Well, how do you, how do you finish a study like this? Uh, let's just jump to the Encyclopedia Britannica and uh, a, a, prov a provision by the Britannica of what they argue Darwin got right, what Darwin got wrong. For right, they say he got right how natural selection works within species. He got right how natural selection creates new species, generally speaking. And Darwin's lines of evidence in support of the theory are fundamentally for the Britannica pretty on, on point. What he got wrong was the Earth's age. 4.5 billion years is way more time than 
Darwin could have imagined the Earth to be. And of course, the mechanisms of variation among individuals, especially the role that genetics plays, no question. Now, when we look at a text like this and we ask at level three, A, how does this text relate to other texts? I've already mentioned, let's just mention a couple. Already, Wealth of Nations comes to mind as a text that's very futuristic thinking, trying to somehow explain what we know up to this point within a given discipline, for Wealth of Nations, it's economics, for here it, uh, in Darwin's text, it's biology, and of course the natural sciences, and then recognizing that it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to build. It's, there's there's going to be a lot of growth from a, from a text like this going forward, no, no doubt. We can also think about the classic texts already mentioned in the Harvard Classics. Plato does come to mind. And the idea of trying to explain the early science, trying to explain. Remember, we defined science early on as the quest to explain the unexplainable. And although today we think we often use somehow language that is not mythic, we still have difficulty really explaining, for example, what energy is. We use the term all the time, but we're not always so good at explaining it. Which takes us finally to level 3B. Your own observations to this text. What are your feelings about origins? When we pick up, for example, Ken Wilber's classic Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, the great integralist evolutionist thinker will often point out that in, the, in his opening lines, the question, when you look at this world, why is there something instead of nothing? Wilber will argue there's basically two schools of thought when that question is raised. One says, don't ask the philosophy of oops, as he calls it. In other words, we're here, don't ask how it happened, who cares how it happened. But there is a counter-argument to that that says, no, if we are the stories we accept or reject, the stories we tell and retell, then it makes a whole lot of difference for us to have some sense of origins, even though we might speak in more of a fallibilist position, that is to say, I don't know if I'm absolutely right on this, but at least to postulate. What are your thoughts on this? Where do you come down on it? Do we need to have any sense of origins? To have any sense of, for example, directionality and sense of purpose, meaning in existence, the notion of right and wrong and morals and ethics and all of that? Do we need to have some sense of origins, do you think at all, or does it not matter at all to you and to those around you in this world? Well, from here, the Harvard Classics, uh, uh, Dr. Elliott shows as his next volume, and it's almost like he decided to do Wealth of Nations and, and, uh, and Origin of Species, and then to say, let's go back now to a classic text, Plutarch's Lives. This is a classic text. We've referenced it a number of times in other lectures. Plutarch, in many ways, invented the notion of biography and forever kind of built up that idea of the quote-unquote great man notion that when you look at history it's really about a given individual and what that individual has done think about Darwin for example as a classic exemplar Darwin lives Darwin writes and then we have this thing called modern postmodern science that happens during the time that we are alive to what degree would we have this today without people like Darwin it's going to be Plutarch that will ask that question come back and I hope that you will enjoy our study with Plutarch's lives thank you very much